little bit different tonight. As you can see, the kids are going to bless us with a song. So you guys could just stay seated. I'm going to open in prayer, and then we're going to hear from the, the children, all right? Let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you so much uh, for being able to be in your house tonight. We ask you to be with our pastor as he's away and preaching. Bless him. Bless the service there. Be with us tonight as Brother Burkholder uh, brings the, the message to us. And uh, prayer time, just everything that would bring honor and glory to you. Be with the children now as they play and sing and that we would get a blessing from that. In your name we pray, amen. Right. Thank you, children. That was good. Our sins are many, but his mercy is more. All right. I'm going to go ahead and give you some announcements, and then we'll sing. So uh, Friday, May 20th, that's Elevate. Uh, VBS Outreach is the 28th of this month. Normal time, 10 o'clock in the cafe. We'll meet there. And then this is a note to the teen girls. Culottes are available for pickup on Sunday, this Sunday, May 8th, after the evening service. Payment may be made in cash or check, and I think if you have a question, you can see Miss Rachel Ray, and uh, if you have a question, or you can just wait till then. June 5th through 9th, Teen Rally, 6th through 9th is VBS, and make sure you sign up at, at the welcome booth for those of you that want to help, but you haven't uh, signed up for what you want to help with there. We will be having a meeting soon, uh, just kind of touch base, but uh, most of you all are pros at VBS, and um, do, do it very well. All right, and then just a reminder also, the four-day VBS, uh, due to scheduling, we knocked out that fifth day, and then also the registration is a little different, so make sure you pay attention to that or friends that are coming. It's based on age, not grade, okay? And then there's the teen camp dates as well. All right, let's, um, I'd like to go to our chorus time, but I want to use the Family of God song. So gentlemen, if we could have the Family of God, let's all stand together, and then we'll have our offering right at the end of this, okay? Offering will be after Family of God. Let's sing it together. I'm so glad. Uh, actually, we need the verse first. That's what threw me off. There we go. And I'll try to start it right this time. Here we go. You will notice we say brother and sister around here. It's because we're a family are near. When one has a heartache, we all share the tears and rejoice in each victory in this family so dear. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I'm 
That seemed a little high, but that's right, right? Okay, maybe it's just my voice or allergies. I'm going to blame it on the allergies, okay? Oh, there we go. That's lower? That's lower? Is that, that is lower. Okay. I guess I'm not doing good at listening right now. That's dangerous when you're supposed to be the music guy. Okay, how many of you know the chorus well on this one? Okay, how many of you do know the verse? Yeah, that's what I thought. We, we struggle, but we need to practice. So let's go to verse 2. We got the words up there. Let's do the best we can. Here we go. Verse 2. Ready? From the door and an orphanage in the house of the king, no longer an outcast, a new song I sing. From ranks unto riches, from the weak to the strong, I'm not worthy. Praise God, I belong. I'm so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood. Join heirs with Jesus as we travel this side. For a part of the family. The family of God. All right. Well, I apologize. That was kind of bad. Hey, Philip. Yeah. Will you forgive me? I didn't do too good singing tonight. You won't forgive me? Okay. Well, that's all right. I think he, I think he means... Yeah, yeah. You guys did good on the bells. That was good. Were you playing the bells or were you singing? You were doing the bells? Okay. Yeah, I couldn't see. A lot of people were blind. All right, I'll stop talking here with, with Philip. All right, let's remember to be in prayer for pastor, as I already mentioned, and uh, let's be faithful in our giving. And let's see, who shall I get tonight? How about hmm, Joshua? How about you pray for us, all right? And then Leah's going to bless us with a song on the piano. All right, go ahead. Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I pray for this good day, Lord. I bless... Uh, Whoever is preaching, Lord, then give them wisdom to preach, Lord, and for the offertory that will go well, and for the offering that pe people give as God wants them to give, Lord Jesus. Amen.
Well, how special is that? Leah getting to play with her grandfather. How many of you knew that Brother Burkholder played the piano? Yeah, how many of you didn't know that he played the piano? <laughs> that was a neat surprise there. I happen to know that. But um, yes, that was great. Thank you both. Kind of threw, threw me off guard. I thought Leah was going to play piano, and he was walking up there, and I thought, oh, no. All right, our uh, Missionary of the Week is actually a ministry we support uh, more than just one missionary. This is the Christian Radio International, uh, but this is a great letter that I wanted to just read to you because we couldn't even put the whole thing um, in there. But you can follow along if you want, but it does uh, affect those in Ukraine. So uh, listen here, and I'll do my best to, to be coherent here. Anatoly uh, couldn't sleep. In fact, he hadn't slept well in weeks he must make a decision quickly. As a born-again believer and a deacon in a Baptist church south of Kiev, Anatoly knew how to pray, and pray he did. God, show me what to do. The plan he pondered was ludicrous. Leave Ukraine, reach Chicago. That was all. No details, little funds. How, God? How? My family of six and my sister Ola, with two children, must travel 10,000 miles across six countries in one ocean with almost no money. How is this possible? It wasn't possible except for God. Anatoly fervently prayed, not knowing what God would do. In Chicago, Anatoly's sister, Leuda, and her husband, Andre, gathered $4,000 from family and friends. Leuda's friend, Alicia, spent hours looking for cheap tickets. She opened a Give, Sin, Go account, which yielded another $3,000. CRI broadcaster Paul Dudka in western Ukraine counseled them, leave now. On April 11, 2022, God opened a small window of opportunity. While the Russians retreated, Anatoly acted. Like the Israelites in Exodus, the two families went out, not knowing whither they went. With only one backpack per person, they piled into a van driven by a church friend and started a 360-mile trek west to Paul's house, 30 miles from the Romanian border. God changed the plan to go to Poland when missionary Paul Garrick offered housing and food at a rural Baptist camp outside of Cluj, Romania. After two months of war, Anatoly's family, who had never had a vacation in 23 years, thought Camp Falcon Rock was a holiday in paradise. Later, Anatoly learned that several refugees had been killed on the road to Poland. After Paul Garrick mentioned that tickets to Mexico City might be cheaper from Hungary, Laiuta's friends scoured the internet and saved 50%. The flight cost only $7,000, exactly what they had. In Budapest, after their Hungarian van driver treated the refugees to McDonald's, 12-year-old Diana, whose birthday was April 20th, declared the luxury to be the best birthday I ever had. The next challenge was Mexico City, where horror stories abounded. Passports were sometimes withheld, Visas denied and refugees kidnapped. Uncertainty plagued the friends and family who worked around the clock to complete visa applications, borrow $2,700 for flights, and decide which border crossing was safer. Tijuana, volunteer help, tent shelter, four-day wait. Matamoros, just opened, no housing, no contacts. God, which one? Matamoros? Why? And then he has Isaiah 65, 24, before they call, I will answer. Unknown to anyone involved, one week before, God had impressed Christian volunteers from God With Us Ministries in Matamoros, Mexico, to begin helping Ukrainian refugees. The very next day, those volunteers found 10 stranded Ukrainians at the airport. Um, this ministry called First Baptist Church of Brownsville, Texas, for assistance. Pastor Steve Dorman offered the church's mission center for housing. Staff members Jeremy and Kristen Knight arranged transportation, food, and housing for the exhausted Ukrainians. The final hurdle, $3,000 for flights to Chicago, loomed insurmountable. Then a miracle happened. Someone donated 138,000 Southwest points, enough to cover the final flight for all nine passengers. Two days after Anatoly's family crossed the border into the U.S., the Biden administration changed the rules and closed the Mexican border to all Ukrainians. The Anatoly family exodus is a book of Acts story. Only God could have orchestrated the events of their lives. These Ukra Ukrainian believers are overwhelmed with gratitude for the hundreds of Christians who have volunteered, prayed, and given to help them reach safety in Chicago. 
They have watched in amazement as God fit the puzzle pieces together. We wanted to quit the very first day, Anatoly testified. We would have, but God was with us. And then Psalm 78, 72 says, So he fed them according to the integrity of his heart and guided them by the skillfulness of his hands. So that's a, a great story. I, again, we don't support them directly, but we support this radio ministry uh, that gave report on this. So let's remember to keep praying for Christian Radio International and actually the many, um, just as, I mean, I know probably lots of you know uh, maybe friends and family that have other different missionaries that are supported in Ukraine. I have a family member that actually um, kind of made me privy to a, a group. It's a Baptist mission board, but it's all Ukrainian, uh, you know, locals. So everybody on the, the board are Ukrainian missionaries. So let's just keep praying for the situation there and the people that have been affected. All right, I'm going to get our prayer bulletin at this time. Then, uh, Brother Grubb, if you could pray for these when we come to pray in just a minute. Daryl Grubb. All right, Pat Eden is at the Nexus uh, Neuro Recovery Center in Conroe. She's made progress, but there's other issues, so let's continue to pray for wisdom and for the family and decisions there. Jack, this is Charles Holloway's brother, is having dental surgery uh, tomorrow. Pray for wisdom for his doctors. Kay Nicholson, this is Judy Hawkins' good friend, had surgery to repair three fractured places in her spine. So let's pray there. And then for her granddaughter, Peyton, as she's having uh, uh, grand mal seizures due to medication changes. And then Cosme Sakito, this is the father of Pat Sison's friend, has leukemia and is now in hospice. Let's pray for his salvation as well. The family of Brother McLeroy, friend of the Salises, after his passing on Saturday. And then uh, I believe also there's some surgery. Uh, the Salises had another request. If you get the prayer chain, I don't think it... Uh, I'm not sure if it made it in here. I don't think it did. Ty McCatherine, this is a family friend of Sandy Mann. Uh, she had bil bi has bilateral pneumonia and sepsis that it's not responding to antibiotics in ICU. So let's pray for her. She's struggling to breathe there. And then continue praying for Verna Ray. This is the wife of uh, Pastor Mike Ray uh, in Napa, California, Hopewell Baptist Church. Uh, we mentioned that uh, last time as well. Jack Fargo was given a 10-day extension. Uh, so recovering from his pneumonia, so we praise the Lord about that because there were some insurance issues. And then Bill Jr., this, oh, here it is. Bill Jr., cousin of the Salises, had open heart surgery today. Also, Aunt Rosemary and, and Daniel, uh, Danielle Jones, uh, family members, are in need of prayer for physical problems and recovery. And then continue praying for Jeannie Vincent's mother, uh, Patty Laxon, who uh, the immunotherapy is no longer working and cancer is progressing. All right, let's pray for these. All right. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our neighbor. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Heavenly Father, we just, uh, what a privilege it is to be in your house, Lord. We just thank you for a church like Christ Church who still has their op doors open on a Wednesday night. Lord, I know many churches around the country have started to forego this, this service. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity we have to come and sing praise to you and also bring our petitions before you, Lord. Please be with our pastor and um, Brother Kevin as they're at this uh, revival, Lord, we just uh, ask that your Holy Spirit would do a mighty work there and also give them traveling mercies coming back. We also ask that you would be with our speaker tonight, Brother Burkholder, Lord, that you would just speak through him and that we'd be have hearts that are ready to hear from you. Lord, we also want to bring these uh, petitions before you. Think of the many health needs. Uh, think of uh, Pat Eden and Jack Fargo, Lord, we just ask for continued healing there and uh, decisions that need to be made for their families. And also think of uh, Mrs. Vincent's mother as well, Lord. Um, 
as well as the uh, Friends of the Hawkins. Lord, we also ask for uh, comfort for for those that uh, loved ones here that were uh, friends of the Salises, that their uh, husband went home to be with the Lord. We just pray that you would uh, work in that family and just give them the comfort that they need. Lord, the many other requests on here that um, that we have, Lord, you know all the needs there. We ask that you would do a mighty work. We love you, Lord. We ask that we would never live our love for you. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. All right. His name is Life. His name is Master, Savior, Lion of Judah, blessed Prince of Peace, Shepherd, Fortress, Rock of Salvation, Lamb of God is He. seated. I'm excited to hear Brother Burkholder tonight. So Brother Burkholder, come and open up the word to us. Why did I say that? Oh no, the mouth usually is one of the biggest problems. I want to um, make a couple of uh, remarks before I actually get into a Bible message <clears throat> this evening. Um, first of all, note that uh, this coming Sunday is Mother's Day. So I trust you'll be much in prayer for the special services on uh, mothers when we honor the mothers. And uh, then I'd like to make a remark or two uh, concerning Brother Pope. I thank God for Brother Pope. He's been a real blessing to me uh, since I retired from the ministry. And I've enjoyed uh, the time being retired, to tell you the truth. I have a lot more time to look into the Bible and uh, to study and to uh, practice on different items and so on. So I praise the Lord for Brother Pope and his ministry here. I believe that he's a sincere man of God who tries his best to the, do the best he knows how for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I got to tell you, it's kind of eerie in a way about the things he and I agree on and the way we were reared. Mrs. Pope, I tell you, he was talking about his mother praying for him. I remember my mother telling me, I'm just going to pray for you. Ruined my whole attitude. Oh my goodness, Mom, why do you have to do something like that? I remember her saying something about playing cowboys and Indians. We did it in Colorado, too. In fact, the business is he said something about he was the cowboy sometimes, and sometimes he was the uh, Indian. Uh, we did the same thing in Colorado. I made, no, I didn't. They wanted to play, my sisters, that is. I didn't make them. 
I was always kind and nice to my sisters. Never a contrary word. Sometimes I'm just too nice for my own good. You don't need to talk to them about that. Just take my word for it. Be that as it may, when I was the Indian, the Indians were the good guys. When I was the cowboy, the cowboys were the good guys. That's the way it's got to be when you're playing around. There are other things that Eri about talking about his dad, my dad being a minister, and the way we're reared and so on. Well, I praise the Lord for it. I've grown to love Brother Pope a great deal. Then I wanted to make a remark or two about the uh, breach of the Supreme Court of the United States gizmo that came out on Monday. Now, um, I am appalled, first of all, about that whole business. But um, I would like to make a couple of remarks concerning what I feel to be the uh, truth behind this business. One is um, they're not outlawing abortion, um, much to my dismay. They are merely throwing it back to the states. And I am one of those people who happens to be for states' rights. I personally feel that the federal government has overstepped its boundaries way too much in our day that we live in. And I'm for states' rights. So they're, what they, as I understand it, are doing is just throwing it back to the states like it was before R.V. Wade ever came out in the first place. <clears throat> and then another thing that I think, and this is maybe kind of my opinion, but I think the idea was leaked on purpose at a specific on purpose time. I feel like that it was done to try to bring great political pressure upon the justices. And I feel like Well, to be plain truthful, that it was an evil design to come out. And I am concerned that Christians need to pray about this a great deal because I think the groundwork is being set for that not to be the case at all. In fact, it seems to me like the protesters were already prompted to get into position at the Supreme Court, what was it, Monday night? I think the second is the day that it came out, uh, Monday evening. And it seems to me like there's a great swelling of evil in this whole business. It seems to me um, that, quite frankly, um, this business about women's rights, now I'm for everybody's rights, but women's rights, I feel like Don Bongino, uh, Dan Bongino uh, in his radio broadcast stated, the left can't even define what a woman is. How in the world are they going to be able to stand up for women's rights? It's LGBTQ, XYZ, whatever they've added to it in this day and age that we live in is, uh, to me, appalling. I cannot understand it. But I want to say this about abortion, if I may. If there were ever the shedding of innocent blood... To me, it's this whole business of the killing of unborn babies. And mark it down. It's not going to stop with just unborn babies. Already there's been a legislative a bill brought about. I understand that makes it up to, I think it's 28 days after birth. Mind you, folks, 28 days after birth to... What are they going to call it then? A homicide or, or uh, abortion too, whatever? Uh, to me, it is appalling. To me, it's just evil of the devil. And it ought to be noted, a little known scripture verse in 2 Kings chapter number 24 and verses 3 and 4. Uh, there, for those of you familiar with the Bible history, will know that Manasseh was on the throne and he was a bad king. Now, he did some good things eventually and seemingly got eh, squared away with God to a certain extent. Uh, but his son Amnon came on the throne, and then Josiah came on the throne. 
Now, Josiah ought to ring a bell with just about everybody because Josiah was a good king, and God stated that he would not destroy the whole shebang for Josiah's sake, and he gave a reason because Josiah's heart was tender and he sought the Lord. But God also said during Josiah's reign, I'm still going to take the nation out. And he gave a reason later on in uh, his son's kingship. What the deal was is God said, because he did evil in the sight of the Lord, and also because of the shedding of innocent blood, which, and this is the quote now, God would not pardon. That comes from 2 Kings 24. Uh, so I think to myself, uh, we're in trouble in this country as far as I see it. I may be a cynic, I may be a pessimist in this business, but I don't see anything getting better, frankly, until the King of Kings and Lord of Lords comes and sets things straight. He's the only one who knows how to do it. He's the only one to be completely fair all around. I'm looking forward to the second coming of Jesus Christ. Now then, that having been said, let's turn in the Bible, if we may please, to 2 Peter chapter number 1. Now these scriptures have been looked at recently, but if I may, I'd like to address a couple of things about them this evening. I'll begin my reading, please, please, in um, verse number 12, 2 Peter chapter number 1, verse 12, Wherefore I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though ye know them, and be established in the present truth. Yea, I think it meet as long as I am in this tabernacle. What he meant was his life here on this earth to stir you up by putting you in remembrance. And boy, there needs to be a stirring up, I think, in our nation today by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle. What he's talking about there is referred to in John chapter number 21. Do you remember where Jesus was talking to Peter? Lovest thou me, lovest thou me, lovest thou me? Yea, Lord, thou knowest I love thee. And Jesus signified what death he should glorify God by. And I believe that Peter realized that that was similar to the Lord's crucifixion. And he said this, Knowing that shortly I must put off this my tabernacle, even as our Lord Jesus Christ hath showed me. Moreover, I will endeavor that ye may be able after my decease to have these things always in remembrance. And then you'll notice in verse number 16 that he saw something. And not only is he speaking for Peter, but he's talking about the other, especially of the 11 or 12 in this particular instance. Note verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. They clearly saw the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, for whatever it's worth, I believe this is actually referring to the experience of the Mount of Transfiguration. You can look at it in Matthew chapter number 17. I believe that's what is in mind here. But I'd like to say this, the Apostle Peter, as well as the others, and not just the 12, but multitudes of eyewitnesses happened to see a lot of things that Jesus did. I'm thinking to myself, when he uses the phraseology, we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and glory of Jesus Christ, that what comes to my mind is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. Do you guys remember, if you turn back to Matthew, keep your thumb in Second Peter there, 
In the book of Matthew, please, in chapter number 28, we have one of the first concocted up stories to deny the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ from the grave. You'll note that he rose again in the first verse. It's at the end of the Sabbath as it began to dawn. They found out that he had arose from the grave. Now, in verse number 60, well, wait. Let's start in verse number 62 of chapter 27. Now, the next day that followed, the day of the preparation, the chief priests and Pharisees came together unto Pilate, saying, Sir, we remember that that deceiver said, while he was yet alive, after three days I will rise again. Command, therefore, they're telling Pilate to command, therefore, that the sepulcher be made sure until the third day. Look at it now. Lest his disciples come by night and steal him away and say unto the people, he is risen from the dead. So the last error shall be worse than the first. Pilate said unto them, Ye have a watch, go your own way. Make it as sure as you can. That phrase, as sure as you can, is an interesting phrase, by the way. You cannot make sure Jesus Christ in the tomb. It wouldn't have mattered if they'd had the whole of the Roman Empire's army there. You're not going to keep Jesus Christ in that tomb. On that third day when he was ready to come forth, out of the grave he came. I mean, think about it. When they came to arrest him in the garden, I've always loved it like Brother Pope referred to not long ago. I've always loved it. Whom seek ye? When he said, I am he, man, the word of his power sent them all flying backwards on the Rennie Tin Tins. It's interesting to me to think, man, if I'd have been some of those guys, I don't think I'd have changed sides right then and there. Uh, what about that Malchus fellow? My goodness. Uh, remember Peter? He's going to help the Lord out. Drew out his sword. Pray for me, brothers and sisters, but I'm enough in the flesh. I'm kind of cheering Peter on in that instance. The Lord probably would have rebuked me too. But here we have it. Peter drew that sword out and he cut off Malchus' ear. Now that's what it says. He cut the ear off. Jesus told him, put your sword up, put the ear back on Malchus, and healed him. Man, had I been Malchus, I don't know. Maybe Malchus did get saved of it. I hope he did. I don't know. I can't say. But be that as it may, it seemed to me like that had been enough to, to stick it to a bunch of them. Had I been Malchus, I would have changed sides right then and there. But uh, here we have now, you, you cannot make sure the power of Jesus Christ. He is omnipotent. And when he desires to do something and gets ready to do it, it's going to be done. And all the atomic bombs in the American arsenal or in the arsenals of all the countries of the world are not going to stop God from doing what he's going to do. We have the great Holy Bible that tells us that for sure. Now here they had this watch. So Pilate says, Make it secure, the, make the sepulcher sure, sealing the stone and setting a watch. Verse number 60 says, 66 says, so they went and did just that. Now then, after the detail of the women coming to the tomb and on their way to tell the disciples in verse number 10, verse number 11 says, now when they were going, now that is going to tell the disciples about the empty tomb. Some of the watch came into the city and showed unto the chief priest all the things that were done. And when they were assembled with the elders and had taken counsel, they gave large money unto the soldiers, saying, Say ye his disciples came by night and stole him away while we slept. And if this come to the governor's ears, we'll buy him off off. Oh, pardon me. We will persuade him and secure you. But buy him off is what they meant. It's been going on since the beginning of the age, I think. It will, 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 will take care of the governor in your behalf. Now, the interesting thing is, is that I understand correctly the customs of that day. In the Roman watch, the soldiers, if you blew what you were supposed to be doing, you were, uh, 
relieved of duty. Period. You remember when the Apostle Paul was in jail at Philippi and the earthquake came set the prisoners all free? Why did that jailer draw his sword out to kill himself? He knew what was going to happen to him. Gloriously, God said, or Paul said, do thyself no harm, for we are all here. Well, here we have this business about the watch. Hey, you guys are to make sure, as sure as you can, which that don't mean anything to God. When he's ready to undo something, he'll undo it. Now here, if it comes to the governor's ears, we'll persuade him and secure you. So they took the money and did as they were taught, verse 15. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. Now, one thing needs to be pointed out here about that watch. If they were asleep, how'd they know what happened? If they weren't asleep, why did they not prevent it? I mean, after all, these disciples were not a mighty band of men ready to take on the world for war. They were scared, hiding in an upper room for fear of the Jews. Uh, now, fellows, if you were asleep, how do you know what happened? And yet that very cunningly devised fable about the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ is still held by many in the day and age that we live in now. Interestingly enough, there are other things that uh, people bring up against the literal resurrection of Christ. Um, one thing that is brought up concerning the literal resurrection of uh, the Lord is what they call the uh, swoon theory. Uh, you know, and that one re is reduced down to simple terminology. He underwent so m much of a beating that when he was on the cross, he fainted. And those folks not being up to par on scientific, scientific medical business thought he died. But he didn't really die. He just fainted. So they put him in the tomb. Uh, this has actually been postulated. They think that because of the coolness of the tomb, the refreshing coolness of the tomb, and the little bit of rest that Jesus got, he was able to come out of that tomb the third day. I mean, he'd had the spear in his side and the blood taken out. He'd been whipped with cat of nine tails. There he was, having been nailed to a cross. Uh, they determined that he had died before Pilate, when they begged the body of Jesus Christ. How in the world is a fellow like that, within that short amount of time, going to be able to revive enough? Oh, and by the way, how were they going to, how was he going to roll that stone away? You mean somebody undergoing that kind of treatment was able to roll that stone away? Well, of course he was, absolutely, because he's God incarnate in the flesh. He could have pulverized that stone and by the word of his power had he wanted to. I cannot believe the swoon theory. And then another uh, concocted up, cunningly devised fable about the literal resurrection of Jesus Christ is the vision hypothesis theory. Now, what that is boiling down to in simple terms is uh, they so wanted him to raise, be risen from the dead that it was such a thing with them, they thought they saw him. Have any of you guys here ever thought you saw something, but you didn't really see it? Anybody like that? Besides me? I mean, I, I got to tell you, like I've said before, I've saved Marsha's life a couple of different times when we were in Austin. That one time, man, I, I saw a snake crawl under her pillow in the bed. Yes, a reptile, live snake. Man, I got her up and I said, get out of here, Marcia. There's a snake under your pillow. Well, she didn't appreciate my saving her life. I woke up from the dream, but I tell you, it was as real as sure as I'm standing looking at you guys down here. 
Man, that snake was under that pillow. I was going to try to get the weapon out from underneath the bed. Only trouble is I have to find it and get it loaded and ready to go. By that time, there's no telling what the snake has done. I remember another time, man, somebody broke into our house and uh, was up there on the second story landing where the master bedroom was up in Austin. And uh, boy, I told Marsha, Marsha, there's somebody in here. And uh, he, he went on down the stairs. Uh, but I, boy, I got my weapon out underneath the bed that time. I shoved that old clip under the handle of that gun and I took off and uh, left Marsha upstairs there with a brass candlestick holder to conk the guy on the head if he showed up there. Well, I got downstairs, looked around in the garage, and it dawned on me I'd been dreaming again. I tell you folks, there, there have been times it seems to me like stuff has been so literal. By the way, Marcia didn't appreciate that either. Okay. I mean, I was just trying to do the best to know how, save the little wife's life and so on. But, she, well, anyway, there have been times when I've been somewhere and thought that I had been there before. But to my historical knowledge, I'd never been around that place. Anybody else like that here? Yeah, I told you I'm kind of a mystery to myself. Even. Be that as it may, a lot of times people think they see stuff. And what the deal is on that is some of the scientists and psychiatrists and so on said, well, they wanted so much for the Lord to be risen from the dead that they thought they saw him, they had a vision. Well, now I can't believe that either because all they would have had to do was to, to see a good neurologist and, and don't do that if you can keep from it, by the way. No, I can't believe that vision hypothesis theory. And then there are those who will still say, well, uh, here's one for you. And Joseph Klausner, in his classic book from the University of Jerusalem, uh, had this in print. He said that apparently what happened is Joseph of Arimathea decided it looked bad on the family name to have someone who was crucified in the family tomb. And so he moved the body. Yes. And the disciples said he had risen from the dead. And Joseph of Arimathea, not willing to bust their balloon. I know it's burst, but bust gets the idea across. He, he not willing to bust their balloon. Uh, didn't want to destroy their joy. So he let it go on. Now the only thing about that is there was a Roman watch there all the time. If... if that would have happened why didn't the Roman soldiers stop it all they had to do was go to the place where he'd really been buried finally after all no I can't believe any of those cunningly devised fables what happened was Jesus was crucified and he died and he was buried and he literally rose again the third day from the grave according to the scriptures in 1 Corinthians 15 obviously there was not a cunningly devised fable. The fact of the business is, the disciples weren't, I don't think, expecting him to rise from the dead at all. Remember Thomas? I will not believe unless I can see him for myself and thrust my hand in his spear-riven side and the print of the nails in his hand. I mean, hey, they weren't looking for the resurrected Lord. The Lord had to prove it to him. Remember when he came and stood in the upper room? Children, have ye any meat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish. He had to devour it to show them that it's me. It's literally me. I'm here. Now, Peter says, we have not followed cunningly devised fables. They saw something. Literally, this is referring, as I said already, to, I think, the Mount of Transfiguration. But keep in mind, brothers and sisters, they saw a lot of things in the Lord. I can imagine the 12 getting together after Jesus ascended back into heaven. You know how people like to get together and rehearse about their various experiences? I can see them saying, 
boy, listen, I saw the Lord rebuke the waves and the angry sea, and immediately this calm came about. Some of them might have said, boy, I saw the Lord touch the eyes of a blind man and give him sight. I saw the Lord make the lame to walk. They saw a lot of things. Peter is saying, I guess I ought to know what I'm talking about. We were eyewitnesses to this whole thing, the proof. And then going back to 2 Peter, for the second thing here, real quick, like, he says they heard something. Please note, verse number 17, for he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory, this is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven, we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. And Peter is saying, I guess I don't know what I'm talking about. I saw and I heard not only me, but the others as well. The thing wasn't done in a corner. Here he comes along and says, we saw and we heard. Now I know many people could say, well, you're hearing things. You're hearing voices. Uh, maybe you've experienced that kind of thing before. But Peter was in the very presence of his mind over and over again after the resurrection of Christ. He heard the Lord himself. Forty days after the resurrection, the Lord was there and they heard something. However, there's a third thing involved here, too. Now, a lot of times you can think you see something, and you may not really see it. Uh, usually, we have the opposite effect. We don't see what we need to see. But a lot of times, people can sometimes, at least, think they saw something when they really didn't see it. And then, a lot of times, people can hear something when it's not there especially if you're scared of the dark when you're a little kid and you hear all kinds of noises come about. But this third thing comes along that is irrefutable, and here it is, verse 19. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, that ye take heed, that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. So Peter says, I saw something, I heard something, but, and may I say more importantly, he read something, the inspired word of God. Mind you now, you can't always trust your eyes. You can't always trust your ears, but you can always trust the Word of God. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. These 66 individual books that make up the canon of Scripture, I believe with all of my heart, are the written word of God. I believe we can trust it without error. It's here. We've got it. It has stood the test of time. You can go to the bank upon the Holy Bible, as it were. You can put your stock in that, and it'll be sure and steadfast. Again, the Bible over and over speaks of its own veracity. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. The Bible... Peter said, I saw something, I heard something, but the bottom line is, I read the Word of God. I have the Word of God. We have a more sure word of prophecy. I can remember a poem that I learned, at least a little bit, I think. I'll try to remember it and bring it to your attention. Last eve I passed beside the blacksmith's door and heard the anvil ring with vesper chime. Then looking in, I saw upon the floor old hammers worn with beating years of time. How many anvils have you had, ask I, to wear and batter all these hammers so? 
Only one, he said, and then with twinkling eye, the anvil wears the hammers out, you know. And so thought I, the anvil of God's word, for years the skeptic blows have beat upon. And though the noise of the blows was heard, the hammers are gone, the anvil is unharmed. You can put your stock in the Holy Bible, the word of God. I like that song, I don't hear it very much anymore, but it's titled, The Bible Stands. The, I know you know it, Mrs. Pope, a good song. The Bible stands like a rock undaunted, midst the raging storms of time. Its pages burn with the truth eternal, and they glow with a light sublime. The Bible stands, though the hills may tumble. It will firmly stand, though the earth shall crumble. I will plant my feet on its firm foundation, for the Bible stands. The Bible stands like a mountain towering far above the works of man. Its truth by none is not refuted, and destroy it they never can. The Bible stands every test we give it, for its author is divine. By grace alone I will try to live it, to prove it, and to make it mine. The Bible stands though the hills may tumble. It will firmly stand, though the earth shall crumble. I will plant my feet on its firm foundation, for the Bible stands. God bless you, Brother Jared. Brother Holloway, do we have that chorus, Thy Word? There we go. We'll sing that. Let's sing that as... If you need to come use the altar, heard the message, and let's take this time and we'll sing this through together. Thy word is a lamp to my feet. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Do we have the rest of the words on that one? We don't have the rest of the words. All right. How many of you know that one? Well, can we try to sing that? Well, hopefully we don't bomb here. When I do, do you have what number is that? It's not in there. All right. Well, this might be. Maybe we shouldn't do that because I I don't know if I can remember them all. All right. Well. Let, let's sing that phrase one more time and then try to go into the chorus. Mrs. Pope, do you, know, do you know the rest of it? Do you know the rest of the... When I am afraid and I think I've lost my way, still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I do, nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Yeah, let's try it. Here we go. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Or when I... When I am afraid and I think I've lost my way, still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be with me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, and a light unto my path. All right, well, that was, a, that was a, a regular when I was growing up, and obviously to some of you it was. So, Brother Holloway, I'm sort of glad that happened. Let's kind of revise it, get the rest of those words, and uh, we'll learn it that way, okay? It sounds like several of you know it, so. All right, well, remember to be in prayer for Pastor as he's coming in tomorrow. 
I think tomorrow afternoon, 319, isn't that his plane? 319, so. All right, is there anything I'm forgetting? Secretaries, anybody? Don't forget to sign up if you want to help with VBS. Okay, thank you, Brother Burkholder. That was fantastic. I loved it. I always love it when I hear you preach. I just want to know one thing. How many times has Mrs. Burkholder saved your life? Yeah. For real. For real. <laughs> All right. Well, let's be dismissed. Um, I'm going to do something a little different. Brother Dickinson, can you lift your voice from back there and uh, just, just close us in prayer from right there nice and loud?